Hi everyone, hope you all are doing well. So as of filming this, it is Women's History Month. And did you know that historically coding was once considered to be a woman's job? Back in the 60s, more than one in four programmers were reported to be women in the US. A similar pattern followed in the UK in 1967, when nearly half of all women went to work in offices after leaving school, many of which went into computer operation and programming. Computer programming became so allied with women's work that some of the key machines used back then were even given female-sounding names, like Suzy, short for stock updating and sales invoicing electronically, Betsy, which was a betting and bookmarking computer, and Sadie, which stood for sterling and decimal invoicing electronically. Not only that, women were even encouraged by society to enter this industry. More notably, this article published by Cosmo in 1967 titled The Computer Girls even compared programming with household chores to appeal to women as it went on to say, programming is just like planning a dinner. You have to plan ahead and schedule everything so that it's ready when you need it. Therefore, women are naturals at computer programming. Going even further into history, it is not difficult to find female figures that have made enormous contributions in this field. The first ever computer programmer in history was a woman named Ada Lovelace, a mathematician, who wrote the first algorithm to be carried out by a computer in the 1840s. Many of us have probably heard of Alan Turing, who helped decipher the Enigma code used by the German armed forces in World War II to send messages. He did so with the help of Joanne Clark, who worked alongside Turing. Even during the moon landing in 1969, it was a woman named Margaret Hamilton, a computer scientist who worked for NASA, that developed the code for Apollo 11, the rocket that landed the first humans on the moon. Yet. Fast forward to today, women make up less than a third of the workforce in STEM fields, with them receiving only 20% of computer science and 22% of engineering degrees in the US. So you might be wondering, what happened? How did a field that once seemed so welcoming and promising to women ended up being so exclusionary? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Marketing. When the gaming industry first kicked off in the 1970s, it wasn't marketed towards any specific gender but as family entertainment. Early games like Pong and Computer Space were considered to be unisex. While the industry was still relatively male-dominated, there were plenty of women that were involved in the early game development scene. If it had carried on in this fashion, gaming would have probably been one of the first truly equal industries which would have led to many iconic iconic female leads, but then the gaming crash happened in 1983. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about the gaming crash in 1983 because most of it is irrelevant to the topic, but I will provide a link to this video made by a gaming historian in my sources that goes over as a chingli. The video is pretty old, but it is still really well made, so check it out if you're interested. But pretty much as video games started to gain popularity after the industry kicked off in the 70s with ever-increasing sales and demands for video games, it led to an overproduction of shallow, low-quality games. This resulted in infuriation and a loss of trust from the consumers, and this lack of consumer trust and retailer confidence led to a gaming crash. At the height of this crash, millions of unused gaming cartilages ended up in landfill, many companies went bankrupt, video game revenue dropped from 3.2 billion to 100 million between 1983 to 1984. So to bounce back from this crash, gaming companies decided to take a different approach. The crash coincided with Nintendo's plans to release Famicom, which was intended to be a family entertainment system. But when you have limited funding, you can't just market shotgun. You can't just go, well, it's unisex, it's intended for everybody. Instead, you have to narrow down your demographic and have a very clear specific brand because that is going to play into what kind of ads you'd be running and where you'd be running them. 
Famicom was rebranded into Nintendo Entertainment System or NES and to appeal to the younger generation, they decided to market it as more of a toy and less of a game. But then that arose a new dilemma. What sort of toy would that be? Would it be for girls or for boys? Ultimately, Nintendo decided to market NES to boys to even further their reach. Because at the time, while it was seen as somewhat okay for girls to play with toys intended for boys, the other way around wasn't as socially accepted. Therefore, if a product was marketed to boys, some girls may still purchase that product. But if it was marketed to girls, no boys would. I do want to stress that this decision was made solely from a marketing standpoint to generate more revenue, not because of gender differences, some innate biological differences like boys are rational, girls are more emotional, or the whole men are from Mars and women are from Venus crap. No, it was all marketing. This new style of marketing, while questioning ethics, ended up being successful for Nintendo and the success reached its peak with the release of the Game Boy console in 1989, which caused many other rifling companies like Sega to double down on this style of marketing, with taglines like, Game Gear separates the men from the boys. This carried on all the way to the start of the 21st century with the release of TV shows like The Big Bang Theory and Silicon Valley, further reinforcing the stereotype of associating computing and STEM with geeky, mostly cishet white men. Pretty much all around, everyone was fed the image of this intricate, highly advanced industry, which also happens to be one of the highest paying industries, is something that men do, it's for the boys. And when all you see while growing up is this sort of marketing, this brainwashing, in fact, many of us probably don't even remember a world where tech wasn't male dominated, it does something to your psyche. Especially, gaming plays a way more crucial role than many give credit for. For most of us, it was probably the first ever proper interaction that we've had with technology. In fact, many people become interested in computing or programming or any other STEM fields through gaming. So obviously, excluding a whole demographic from it is going to make them less likely to pursue those relevant fields. Over the last couple of years, there has been a push to get more women into STEM or in particular tech. Most of these articles recommend encouraging women and young girls into pursuing STEM, which although I'm fully supportive of, I am not particularly a fan of the, some of the language used surrounding this topic. To this day, whenever the gender disparity in STEM is brought up, it's not uncommon to hear at least one person say, well, girls just aren't as interested in maths and sciences. Which is simply not true. As we have seen throughout history, some of the pioneers in technology were women. Even today, research shows that women tend to be better coders than men as long as, you know, they hide the fact that they're women. Even in gaming, which without even getting into the dumpster fire that was Gamergate, just a couple weeks ago I came across this video where they got male gamers to have their voice changed to sound like women through AI and have them play while using a voice chat and it went exactly how you'd expect. Where should I go? Just touch him out. Oh my god. It wasn't even five seconds in. Oh, oh shit. Is that a female? I want to baby. You idiot. Give up. Go back to your thing. Call that Call me daddy. Naughty little girl. <laughs> <laughs> So, there is clearly more to this discussion than it is being addressed. It isn't just about girls not being interested in STEM, so all they need is a bit of push and encouragement. To explore this, I would like to focus on this study conducted by the Stanford University. A bit of a content warning as I will be discussing the topic of rape. Hopefully nothing too extreme, but still wanted to give a heads up just in case. The study investigates how often when reporting incidents of rape, a grammatical passive voice is used. 
Passive language is defined as something that is obscuring agency by placing the actor in the background and the victim in the foreground of discourse. For example, instead of saying, man raped the woman, it would say, the woman was raped by the man. This change of sentence structure may seem trivial at first glance, but subconsciously, it causes you to focus more on the victim and less on the perpetrator. By placing the victim as the subject of the statement, you subconsciously assign more responsibility onto the victim and less responsibility onto the perpetrator. Thus, it leads to victim blaming. The things that we typically hear people say when a woman gets raped. What was she wearing? Why was she drinking? Why was she out so late at night on her own? Meanwhile, her assailant gets little to no scrutiny and likely gets to walk away free facing barely any consequences. Similarly, when I see all these articles suggesting to just encourage women to pursue STEM, it feels short-sighted and seem to ignore the bigger issue. It fails to address that no matter how much encouragement and support are provided to women, in many cases, the tech industry itself is not prepared for women. It fails to mention how nearly half of all women in STEM experience discrimination at some point, how more than 40% of women end up leaving their STEM jobs after starting families. Women should not have to choose between career and family, especially when men typically do not have to make such decisions. And this is happening all over the industries, from small firms all the way to Google that was being sued for pregnancy discrimination less than two years ago. But by befitting the subject onto women, just like victim blaming in rape, it is implying that the systemic barriers that keep women out of STEM are somehow their fault and it is them that needs to work harder and be encouraged to pursue this industry instead of these companies and corporations taking accountability for mistreating their employees, even though that is exactly what is causing these women to drop out of STEM in the first place. It is almost given that women in STEM or any male-dominated industry for that matter, especially women of color, have to work twice as hard just to receive the same amount or even less than their male counterparts. And it shouldn't be like that. If I have to work twice as hard, be absolutely exceptional at my job, just to receive the same amount of benefits and recognition as say a cishet white man, that is not fair. And I hate how normalized that is. If a system structurally disadvantages you, puts you at an unfair standard to succeed, failing at it is not entirely your fault. It is not you that needs to be critiqued as to why aren't you as interested in this field as others, but the system that puts you in this situation in the first place. But say, even if hypothetically, we did manage to encourage a significant amount of women and young girls to pursue STEM. To the point, women start to outnumber men in STEM and the industry starts to become more female dominated. What then? Do you really think that these women would be able to receive the same benefits and recognition as their male counterparts once did? At the start of the video where I discussed how coding was once seen as a woman's job back in the 60s, it's important to note that these employers did not hire women because they respected women and wanted to promote diversity and equality in the workplace and etc. all that crap, but because coding was seen as an easy job. Back then, men typically worked in hardware and women worked in software because they believed it to be easier, which we now know is false. Many employers were able to get away with paying women less because women's labor was undervalued. And thus, even though these women were doing the job of a programmer, they were never recognized as such. Instead, they were referred to as typist, which the fact that one of the computers called Suzy that I mentioned before, the machine for stock updates and invoicing, came with a 130 page manual on programming goes to show how inaccurate it was to refer to these women as simply typists. 
And in the 60s, it would have been even harder to program without having access to any external sources, just that hard copy of a manual to work with. Yet in a lot of cases, these women were not only undervalued, but were used during sales to show other business consumers that computers were easy to run. A lot of the historical figures that I mentioned earlier did not receive credit for their work until decades or even centuries later. But none of this is really surprising. We have seen this before, with professions like teaching and nursing that were once male-dominated. Once women and people of other marginalized groups begin to enter these professions, their value goes down and workers are paid less. So my question is, what is stopping STEM and other tech industries from happening the same? And if so, would having more women enter this industry prevent it? The thing that most people are hesitant to address is that under a patriarchal system where men hold most of the power in society, this is something that is supposed to happen. This is not a bug but rather a feature of the system where women are systematically barred from powerful positions in society. So instead of discussing how we can get more women in STEM or other high paying industries, a more productive discussion would be on how we can unionize every industry so that everyone can get paid a living wage. Like a couple weeks ago, this absolute dumpster fire of an article came out that outlines how women on average hold more student loan debt than men and take longer to pay it back, thus putting them at a greater economic disadvantage. But when it came to discussing why it was the case, they have just resorted to, well, women just end up in lower paying jobs, whereas men typically go to trade school or enter the tech field and do something useful, unlike, you know, teaching and nursing. Like, instead of questioning why teachers and nurses aren't getting paid more, they have resorted to, huh, why do women enter such low paying fields? <laughs> Classic victim blaming right there. But one thing to note is that tech is not some sort of a holy grail that is guaranteed to lift you out of poverty and build generational wealth. Recently there has been a push to break into tech, especially on TikTok. I've been seeing a lot of day in a life working in tech that show people working cushy jobs with free food and snacks and Harry Potter themed conference room. This also coincides with the soft life trend that I've seen that mostly black women partake in, which is pretty much promoting a lifestyle of comfort and relaxation with minimal stress and challenges, implying that working in tech isn't as stressful and demanding as other industries. And I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but that is not the case. Especially if you come from a background with no prior experience in coding, it is very unlikely that the first job you'd land in tech will pay six figures, let you work from home and provide other benefits. Tech, like any other industry, is going to get oversaturated once many people start entering it. And while the demand is still there for people with the relevant experience, for entry-level workers, there is already a lot of competition. Hence, you end up with all these job postings on entry-level jobs wanting three to five years experience. This focus on STEM dates back all the way to the space race between the US and Russia after Russia landed the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik, on the moon in 1957. It got the US government shaking in its boots which caused them to sign the National Defense Education Act, NDEA for short, in 1958, funding a billion dollars into the subjects of maths, sciences, and foreign languages. That is where the fervor for STEM really kicked off. It was promoted as a patriotic thing to study maths and sciences and pursue STEM as a career. But these days, in the post-Cold War era, pursuing STEM has become less about serving your country and more about serving yourself, your family, and of course, your bank account. But like I said, depending on your experience and expertise, a high paying job in tech is not always guaranteed. And I hate how whenever the gender gap in STEM is being discussed, the topic of money is brought up, almost like they're trying to lure women into STEM just because it is a high paying industry, which makes sense as women do tend to suffer from economic hardships more than men. 
But pursuing STEM just for money is not going to make you last in the industry, especially when success isn't guaranteed. And even if you do end up with a high paying job, is it worth it if you're not really into it? I don't mean to sound all corny like money can't buy happiness, but if there is one thing I would like for you to take away from this video is to do what you want, follow your passions, your dreams, desires, because every job is important, every job is necessary for the society to function, whether it be STEM or no, and thus every job needs to pay a living wage and meet the workers' needs. Job security, high pay, flexibility and other perks shouldn't be reserved just for the STEM industry. So that's all from me for today. Thanks for watching, especially if you made it till the end. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in my next one. Bye!